This is Mae Russell. It is tape number 862, June the 13th, 1988. There was a small article in the Houston Post titled, uh, Dallas Museum Plan Upsets the Kennedy Clan. This was June the 1st, uh, 1988. It comes out of Quincy, Massachusetts. Members of the Kennedy family are upset with Dallas officials' plans to make a museum out of the building used as an assassination perch in the killing of President John Kennedy. Friends who didn't want to be identified said that if the family is really dismayed. It's such a poor idea. I don't believe they even want to discuss it, but they're very upset by the fact that the Historical Society in Dallas is going to make a special site for uh, the place where John Kennedy was murdered. What is of interest to me in this story is that the Kennedy family reacts to hardly anything. I should say nothing. The only thing uh, that uh, Jacqueline Kennedy objected to, at least that we read about, was the book of William Manchester, The Death of a President, and there was a lawsuit to delete sections out of that book. Other than that, the accumulated family members, and I read off the names of Bobby Kennedy's family last week, have said nothing so far and about any of the information or evidence that has come out about the uh, plans to kill John Kennedy that were set long time ago by the Daltex building location for rifle shots, the Grassy Knoll, the, that location, the CIA, uh, Bay of Pigs persons that worked w not only with the assassination teams, but one of them partic in particular was in Dallas that day, Frank Sturgis, admits he was there. Nothing has outraged them, but now the museum is going to be officially dedicated, I'm sure, November 22nd, 1988, on the 25th anniversary of the murder of John Kennedy. Uh, after 25 years, they don't like the idea of the museum. Well, the museum has been planned for years, and I've had it on different broadcasts earlier. Uh, up, I don't know how they're catching on at this point, that it's offensive, but at least maybe somebody's catching on. The London Sunday Times, May 29th, 1988, had a small article which caught my eye because I didn't know why it was appropriate except as the anniversary of Kennedy's death appears, and it's sort of like a mind controller, or mind slot, giving a person an idea, a spot coverage of a news story that maybe you pick up. It has to do with the murder of John Kennedy, and uh, the question was asked, where were you when John Kennedy was killed? John McEwen was a policeman on the beat at Newbury. This is in England. Someone said they heard on the radio that John Kennedy was killed, and so when I saw two tall Texan United States airmen from Greenham common, I asked if it was true. They said yes, and they smiled. I realized they were pleased at the news. I still remember with this belief, that, but then we should remember that in Texas, in the schools, Children cheered at the news. Uh, I don't know how he saw two tall men and knew they were Texans, but that's the story uh, that's just recently, a week, two weeks ago, in the London Times, and I don't know for what reason that was printed at this time, except maybe to pass the message, the subtle subliminal message, uh, you don't have to be sad about it. A lot of people were glad that he was killed. That's the way I interpret these little spot things that are non sequitur and reaffirm the belief of a lot of people that Kennedy should be wiped out. And so he's uh, talking about the school children's reaction to the death and also airmen from the United States service uh, in the service in Great Britain. Last week I talked about Gorby Dahl and uh, a section of an article, just a quotation from an article whereby he said, that there are two governments, uh, that the secret government, the National Security Council government, and then the Congress and the elections are the showpiece, that these uh, two separate branches uh, exist, if you say exist, side by side. Actually, the Congress and the electoral process was taken over by the National Security government. Uh, just as I began my article, my first published article, there are two governments side by side, one visible and the other invisible, but that was the Watergate story in 1972, and certainly the National Security Council has had more visibility since then. To continue with the Gore Vidal story, he has an article in Nation, it was published June 4th, 1988, the National Security State, 
how to take back our country. I'm not going to give you his suggestions because I don't agree that these are the ways to take it back. But he goes into the fact that the American Empire started officially in 1898 when we took over the Philippines and came to a peak in the year 1945 when we decided when the war was over that we would control the countries that we had conquered, Germany, Italy, Japan. We'd take over their economies, their political lives, and that we, the United States, would begin with full military basis. Uh, we would take over the private sector and be on a standby, a continuing plan, as referred to by Charles E. Wilson, a businessman, and uh, it refers to a quotation in 1944, a full preparedness and a continuing plan. And then this article goes on to say how Harry Truman escalated the Cold War and decided that every country that uh, uh, was on the border of Russia was, was to be followed by the American police system and that there's no country too remote to serve as a scene of contest that may widen until it becomes a world war. And this is, in fact, what is happening. What is a national security state, Gore Vidal asks, because in order to con continue to keep military control of our former enemies and then our allies and all the neutral countries, it would take a national security state. He said it began with the National Security Act in 1947. It was implemented in January 1950, when the National Security Council provide a blueprint for a new kind of country, and this is, of course, the thing that I've been harping upon for years, unlike anything the United States has ever known. A document called NSC-68 that was only declassified in 1975 commits us to the following. First, never negotiate ever with Russia. Two, develop the hydrogen bomb, so when the Russians get the atomic bomb, we'll be one step ahead. Three, build up your conventional forces. Four, put a large increase in taxes to pay for all of this. That's what our national debt is all about right now. Five, mobilize the entire society of America to the terrible specter of communism. And this is where Senator Joe McCarthy comes in. And before he began this mobilization and the red attack and the smears and so forth, he went to Dachau prison and released Fritz Kramer. He, this is what Vidal doesn't put in as a solution. He doesn't even mention that. Six, set up a strong alliance system that became NATO. Seven, make the people of Russia feel that they're our allies. It's just the communist system that's wrong. And the CIA will be doing, of course, the active uh, participation. We have our Radio Free America and uh, United States Information Agency and the various radio broadcasts. David Emery has a series of tape broadcasts called Radio Free America, and I'm so used to uh, using that name that the air station used by our country is not Radio Free America. Uh, but I, <laughs> that was a slip there because the real title should be Radio Free America. Our uh, radio for uh, propaganda is not for a free America. Then his article uh, goes on to the fact that Truman, Harry Truman, was used for a series of speeches starting in October of 1947, as soon as the CIA was warned about the Red Menace, that France was in danger, Italy was in danger. And of course, keep in mind that Klaus Barbie and the fascists were running Italy right after the war and have consistently been part of attempted coups along with the help of our government. And Tom Clark, the Attorney General for Harry Truman, published a list of distant, dissident organizations in December of '47. So the climate of fear was maintained by the Truman successors, and Gore Vidal refers to this as the cynicism of the coup d'etat. He, he calls the National Security uh, State and the National Security Act of 47 as being a coup d'etat. I always refer to the shots that went out in Dallas as being the coup d'etat in America because that ended the electoral process as of 1960, where there were free elections, and since then they've been run with uh, blackmail and bullets and now with computer manipulations that I'll do more on next week. But uh, this was a coup d'etat because America was really taken over and all parts of our government were geared towards the anti-Russian World War III thinking, and our economy is geared towards that. And he refers to the fact that they literally hijacked the country. 
established military conscription in peacetime, overthrew governments that that do not please them, and keep the rich very happy, and uh, the poor pay mostly through taxes and our national debt for this terrible thing that happened. And yes, indeed, it happened, and I don't think it was a coincidence. This was all planned, and I've mentioned many times the meetings with Reinhard Galen's agents and SS Carl Wolf and Heinrich Himmler's persons with William Donovan of the OSS and Reinhard Galen, who flew to this country and set up the NSC and the CIA, identical to the secret government that was put into power after the Versailles Treaty until Hitler could be in full regalia by 1933. I've mentioned before the book Secret Warriors. It just came out by Stephen Emerson. I haven't read it. I've read parts of it. But uh, there was just recently in the Miami Herald a review of this book called Exploring the Cancerous Cells of Secrecy. And the problem is that the investigators who are doing the exploring are private, uh, we used to call them muckrakers, uh, private investigators, private authors. Steve Emerson is doing what the Tower Commission should have done, except they appointed people like uh, General Scowcroft, who was a national security advisor and on the board of Kissinger's Associates, Kissinger Associates and so forth. So the uh, the NSC should have been destroyed at the time of Watergate and not after Watergate, certainly the Iran-Contra affair. And, of course, this book goes into the fact that where secrecy and democracy conflict, secrecy dominates and it warps democratic ideals. And that our secret uh, missions and our special armies, like the Special Operations Division, and, of course, the Green Berets and the Rangers and the Seals, etc., are the private armies that are really going to bring us fascism in this country. And now, uh, Gorby Dahl is uh, speaking up about it, which I wish he had done years ago, uh, as early as I caught on to the National Security Council, because a lot of people attack the CIA, Philip Agee, John Stockwell, and I could list 30 or 40 books where the CIA is the whipping boy. It is the National Security Act. I said it before and may be saying it every single week until I discontinue this series because that is where the problem is and has been bringing Nazis to the country and forming the National Security Act and really taking over this country. It was a coup d'etat uh, in 1943, starting in Berlin, Switzerland, and it finalized, of course, in Dallas, where the election process was over. Now, speaking of election process, I can't fail but mention that Eugene McCarthy, again, wants to run for president. What does it mean? He's not going to win. He unsuccessfully ran three times, but he has a press conference. He has a, a party that he calls it the Consumer Party from Philadelphia in 1967. But all Eugene McCarthy does is go around splitting votes and uh, taking, not from the Republicans, from the Democrats only. And it is really a tragedy. Jim Garrison, not the attorney in New Orleans, but the Jim Garrison out here in California, who was one of the founders of Christic Institute with Danny Sheehan, uh, ran for office. His primary campaign was in the Palo Alto, Silicon Valley area. He didn't get enough to uh, make any dent to become a member of Congress. He may someday. But coming out to help him raise money for this event was uh, Eugene McCarthy. And that made me very concerned and suspicious about the fact that this fellow uh, comes into our area because uh, he goes wherever he can go, I suppose, because his sole role has been to split the Democratic Party, not to combine it uh, so that we get or they get the maximum amount of votes. If you look at the book, maybe you don't have it. They're hard to get. The, the book is called Who's Who in the CIA? It was published in 1968. Uh, I've had this and shared this before with you. There's Eugene Joseph McCarthy, born uh, March 29, 1916, a teacher, professor of economics at St. John's University, and he was in the War Department in 1944, a member of Congress, uh, 81st, 85th Congress, a senator from Minnesota, worked for NATO, and he has been a member of the CIA. His operational base, according to this book, and this came out a long time ago, of course, 20 years ago, but he hasn't been anything but divisive for 20 years. His base is in Washington, D.C., and he was the one who had all the counterculture putting daisies 
on their Volkswagens and thinking that that little peaceful group could uh, stop the war in Vietnam. He didn't stop the war in Vietnam, and Henry Kissinger and uh, it was Richard Nixon who used it for again for electoral purposes and had it timed for their uh, his reelection in seventy two and in nineteen sixty eight. All you had to do was to kill Robert Kennedy and have the big riots in Chicago and pay off um, Hubert Humphrey. And Richard Nixon was back in the saddle where he wanted to be in 1960 when he lost to John Kennedy. There was a meeting of the platform committee, people making the platform at Mackinac Island uh, this uh, weekend. And there was a story from the Washington Post about the meeting that would be held about the platform committee would have Representative William Gray from Pennsylvania heading the committee. And then for help, they would go to Theodore Sorensen, always described as a speech writer for John Kennedy, but never cared a bean for who killed John Kennedy, another one of those silent friends. But Sorensen is a person who I've described in other broadcasts, particularly when Gary Hart wanted, for run, wanted to run for president, because Sorensen uh, was... Uh, a person promoting Gary Hart, again, a very divisive kind of an operation. I never trusted Hart, and Sorensen is very, very close to Henry Kissinger, and he also wrote a book on the electoral process. He's the man, one of the many men who wants to do away with Senate, that the senators would be appointed, a president would be six terms only, and we'd have elder statesmen in the Senate like Zbigniew Dubrzynski and Henry Kissinger, and Gerald Ford and Richard Nixon, and uh, he has written a very, uh, I think it's a terrible book on destroying the American Constitution, and he, again, like Senator Joe McCarthy, in my mind, has been a detriment to the Democratic Party, if there is a Democratic Party. I don't want to make too many comments on George Bush more right now. I'll do more later. Uh, I suppose you saw the stories or watched Nightline with George Bush uh, Ted Koppel, Ankerman, was talking to him. And three different times, George Bush was calling him Dan Rather. Uh, I'm wondering if we have another mind-controlled president. He said, he apologized later. He said to Koppel, I apologize for calling you Dan. I wasn't being smart. I can't see you. I'm in Houston, Texas. Well, you know, Ted Koppel has had Nightline on for, I guess, 10 years or whatever. And there hasn't been a guest who didn't know who they were talking to. There hasn't been a person uh, who didn't know they're trying to Ted Koppel, and many of them aren't sitting in the same room with Ted Koppel. And this was just outrageous that uh, uh, he kept confusing him with Dan Rather. And I, I wonder, as I say, if there's another mind control zombie here who doesn't watch any of these programs, doesn't know any of uh, these people. This is a man who was our CIA director and who wants to be president of the United States. The Miami Herald had a story May 29th, 1988, <clears throat> about Iranian influence that might meddle the U.S. presidential race. And now the tables are turned a little bit. It's by Richard Feen, F-E-E-N. It's titled, GOP and the Democrats must stand firm. They expect the Iranians to meddle in U.S. presidential race. Well, isn't that cute? I think that's just really righteous. The article says how they meddled with the hostage crisis in 1980 and held back the hostages and that with the trouble that Jimmy Carter had with the hostage crisis, but not a paragraph about Ronald Reagan and the possibility that his team uh, were having an exchange of arms to Iran for holding the hostages until Richard Allen uh, became national security advisor. And Edwin Meese was in on that affair, and he became the um, uh, <laughs> attorney general. I, I hate to say that because he may be out soon. The report's coming in on Meese. But the point is that this Richard Fien is saying you have to be very careful because the Mideast may influence our elections. Well, what if Khomeini decide to hold the hostages up Till Dukakis was in. What if he was tired of Ronald Reagan's uh, lies and his distortions or the way he behaved after they helped to hold the hostages back and they don't like the way the Persian Gulf was mined and so forth? I had totally come I told Khomeini may be very angry at Ronald Reagan this time and he's had eight years of Reagan. So they may do something dramatic. We don't know. 
But this person who wrote the article was saying that both parties should stay away from uh, the Iranians and be on the alert that they could use our elections for some meddling when they obviously were used by the Republican Party in 1980. And uh, uh, this, say, isn't in the article. Also, in the same article coming out of Miami Herald, there's a subtitle called Bush Blames the Israelis. Whether... Now, part of this article says that George Bush uh, believes that the Israelis were to blame for the Iran-Contra affair, and moreover, he supported earlier Arab attempts to stabilize it and the oil prices. Well, Bush is an oil man. Uh, all of you know that. It's a pet of oil. And, of course, he, his interests are very closely aligned to oil platforms and Middle East or anywhere around the world that needs oil platforms. So uh, George Bush at this time in the Miami Herald is coming out, which he did earlier, and blaming Israel for the Iran Contra affair, which I think is very interesting. Now, there are a lot of earth-shaking articles, about 60 or 70 I wanted to put on this one tape and can't, but there is one that really blows my mind, and this is titled, Reagan Blames the 1960s for the Drug Problems. This came out of the San Francisco Chronicle, June the 10th, 1988. President Reagan said yesterday that America's problem, America's problem with drug use in the workplace stems in part from the students in the 1960s and 70s who experimented with illegal substances, substances and retained their destructive drug habits. In many ways, our country is still paying for the erosion of our values and the decline in self-responsibility that occurred in the 60s and 70s. Reagan said in a speech to corporate leaders trying to drive drugs from the workplace. Now, Reagan was the governor in California from 1968 to 1974. He had a continuing attack against people who protested the war, who were working for the farm workers, for the Venceremos, for various political organizations. He hated them all. He hated the musicians. And uh, the uh, marijuana around uh, turned people on, the lifestyles of the people was totally offensive to Ronald Reagan and the people around him, like Edwin Meese and the um, group that went to Washington with him. And there was an ongoing battle continuously, which I summarized in the book, not the book, the article, the SLA is the CIA. And to blame the youth people and the people, students of the 60s and 70s for the destructive habits is horrendous. Now, there's so many books out on drugs and the United States government's involvement. One of the most recent is Acid Dreams by Martin Lee and Bruce, Bruce Schlein, published in 1985. And it tells you about the CIA and LSD and the 60s rebellion. And, of course, the laboratories of um, IG Farben, the same laboratories that made poison gas at Auschwitz with their Sandoz labs and with Mr. Hoffman, made approximately 34 million LSD that Alan Dulles brought to the United States, and of course they distributed them all around the youth people, the protesters, the students, and we handed them out like candy. And of course these suckers fell for it. They shouldn't have. But the CIA was handing what you call illegal drugs if it came from the government. How do you define that? And of course I was mentioning last week and have continuously talked about the role of Lucky Luciano and how Frank Sinatra, one of Reagan's closest friends, was with Luciana in 1947 in Italy and also in Cuba. And this was the hub of the drug network that was to pour into this country after World War II with Meyer Lansky and offshore islands. And uh, the drug connections are so horrendous. What we're paying now is a penalty of releasing Lucky Luciana and putting him in Navy intelligence and putting Santos Traffic Canada and John Rosselli and Sam Giacana into the CIA. The book Stefano Della Calle goes into the connections of drug and violence and terror. And, of course, one of the best books on the involvement of our country in bringing in drugs is The Great Heron Coup, written by Heinrich Kruger in 1980. And if I wanted to spend the rest of this tape, I could cite page after page of the use of the mafia. And even a Great Heron Coup goes into a member of uh, Gerald Ford's National Security Council, working with mafia dealers, New York mafia families, and uh, the use of mafia working all the way up to the NSC, which is identical to Donald Gregg 
at working in NSC with George Bush, dealing with Gomez Rodriguez. Medellin Rodriguez has fingered him with $10 million of narcotics money. And the gall of the chutzpah of Reagan, going back to the 60s and 70s, is horrendous. A, a good friend in the Bay Area who sends me my articles from Italy that I have often on the air that he translates, sent me one article that was just published a year ago that epitomizes what Ronald Reagan is covering up, what this country is covering up, the fascist elements of the National Security Council, the drug running, the CIA, the links to Klaus Barbie, and uh, I want to share this article with you to counter this ridiculous BS that Reagan puts out about the 60s and 70s and the morals going down at that time. This article is published from Grandma out of Havana, Havana Cuba, June the 21st, 1987. It's from Buenos Aires, and it goes this way. The arrest in San Paulo, Brazil, Brazil of Argentine terrorist Alfredo Mario Mingola in a drug cleanup operation is expected to lead to more information in the connection between the United States Central Intelligence Agency and the worldwide drug network. And remember, George Bush was director of the CIA at the hub of a lot of these activities uh, that I'm going into. It, the article says that Mangola was arrested as part of an anti-drug division by the San Paulo Federal Police, and he's involved with an operation in Bolivia. His close ties are to uh, Captain Flores of Bolivia, an Army officer. The Special Division Investigating Drug Traffic in Argentina worked with the San Paulo Police. Formerly a Catholic priest, Mingola lived in Bolivia between 1980 and 83, and Reagan was in office from elected in 80 in 81 to 83. Uh, Mingola there worked as an expert in political repression, sent there by the Argentine Army, and at the time the Argentine Army had him there, they were training the Contras with Ali North and our National Security Council down in uh, Nicaragua up until the times of the Falklands War. The article says he worked as an expert. Oh, okay, as I had that sense of political repression, he worked under Colonel Luis Arce Gomez. This is a close friend of the Republican Party, of course. And uh, he helped uh, with those people who had toppled the constitutional regime of Lydia Guler. Mer Mingolas has been mentioned by former Bolivian Minister of the Interior, Gustavo Sanchez, as a collaborator of Nazi Klaus Barbie. And, of course, Mr. Gomez Rodriguez, uh, George Bush's friend and co-worker, worked with Klaus Barbie in the murder of Che Guevara. So the Bush connections, of course, go down to these roots also in the Reagan administration. Mingola carried out his intelligence work for the Bolivian Army while he did drug traffic operations with Mr. Gomez. One of Gomez's henchmen, Italian Emilio Carboni Basigalupo, uh, bought an estate in Bolivia where he would be growing coca uh, with Mr. Mingola. Mingola helped start the activities of Reverend Moon's organization, CAUSA. And not only was Reverend Moon put together by Mr. Ryosha Sasakawa, Japanese mafia, but the Italian Argentine fascist had a hand in forming CAUSA. That's the Anti Communist Confederation of American Societies. Of course, CAUSA is big in Central America. It's an international organization set up by the Moon sect, and Mingola was instrumental to set that up. And, of course, I've mentioned on other uh, tapes the fact that uh, Mr. Uh, Bohai Pak worked with Klaus Barbie and with Mr. Gomez and the drug dealers down there. So this close, close group, they're very close to each other, and they tie into drug traffic, assassination squads, death squads, and, of course, always the anti-communists. This article says that uh, Mingola worked for military intelligence of Honduras. He worked in Guatemala and also in Panama between 1976 and 1980. George Bush was CIA director in 1976. When arrested in La Paz, he said he took his special training at the School of the Americas in Panama to wage against the anti-communist struggle. He hadn't been a military man, but the Argentine military intelligence legalized his military status. All he had to do was a pay, be a paid killer. Mr. Mingola is close to Stefano Della Calle, founder of the fascist group. Um, it's the three A's, the Avanguardia Nazionale, and uh, is 
the stories of Stefano Dalke I've had on other tapes. Also, his links to Prince Borghese, who was part of setting up Permadex, that was responsible for the murder of John Kennedy. Uh, this tape side is just about out, so we're going to take a 30-second break, turn it over, and I'll continue with Mr. Mangola, a typical uh, comrade of Ronald Reagan and George Bush, the real drug connections, not the 60s and the 70s. This is May Russell. It is side two of tape number 862, June the 13th, 1988. Continuing this article that came out just one year ago, but is very pertinent to the kind of rewriting of history that we're getting, like all the drugs are from the 60s and 70s from the President of the United States. Remember the Nugenhan Bank, the money, uh, drug money that was there, a billion dollars from admirals and generals involved with drug traffic from Southeast Asia, and the narcotics have flowed in even into the dead corpses of soldiers into this country. The drug problem, the heroin and the opium, not the opium, the cocaine, etc., flowed into this country, uh, actually flowed in with the Vietnamese War, and with the administration, as soon as Kennedy was killed with, Ronald, with Richard Nixon in power, of the Shah of Iran and the Indonesian and Southeast Asian drugs coming from two places, from the Pacific over to the Pacific coast, and the others going to Marseille to be processed, and then into the United States. The drugs were flowing. And uh, I suppose that the uh, presidency and the drug traffics were all supposed to be part of the national security state when it was set up. One to do the killings and doping the people and the other to rule the world. Otherwise, why let out Lucky Luciano? So uh, I, it outrages me to think of what, how Reagan simplifies things. But to get back to this article about Mr. Mingola, it continues about his close work with Stefano Della Calle, who is now in a uh, jail in Italy serving uh, time. He fled Italy. Uh, for 17 years and then was taken back for trial of bombings and murders in Italy, including the Bologna train station bombing where over 80 people were killed. And the article says that Stefano Della Calle, when he was arrested in Venezuela, and he's a close friend of Mr. Mingola, had documents in his possession listing the name, the occupation, and the addresses of 13,000 800 Italians, some living in Venezuela, who held political positions in fascist organizations. 13,800 fascists. Where is Simon Wiesenthal? Where are the Jewish leaders? Where are the people, not only Jews, but people who want freedom? This is one country, Italy, 13,000, and I believe, from the way I read the newspapers constantly, that this is a problem in every country. It has continued since World War II, and that the money from the Nazi gold and the Nazi and Japanese banks was sold it away and then released, and now these people are really arming for what the national security state wanted in 1947 and what it could get in two or three years. 13,800 Italians, just from one country. The article concludes, following Mingola's arrest in San Paolo, uh, a source consulted in Buenos Aires said the authorities might possibly have been tipped off by Della Calle, who's in uh, jail in Italy, because maybe he would get uh, some leniency for his bombing efforts if he named Mr. Mingola as a drug trafficker. And it concludes Mingola, who admitted a, in Bolivia to have been in the pay of the CIA, was part of, he said, uh, a drug traffic operation. He was captured in an anti-drug operation, and he may be a key figure, according to the person who wrote this article, in evidence of the CIA Argentine Bolivian military drug traffic uh, if he were would be allowed to testify in Italy. So of course, we haven't heard a word from him, and if I didn't have this wonderful friend to send me these articles, we wouldn't even be able to share this material. Uh, speaking of drug traffickers and one of the international leaders of the fascist movement of Mr. Mingola and the P2, Stefano Della Calle, 
Lizzie O'Jelly is in an Italian jail now, and according to a Swiss journal, May 18, 1988, from the same friend, it says that Lizzie O'Jelly has started to talk. Uh, he doesn't want responsibility for the Bologna bombing, and in the course of his uh, uh the trial hasn't really, I think, started where he's publicly speaking. He's giving ra radio and television interviews. He confided that he had hidden abroad a 500-page testimony of Michele Sindona, the Sicilian banker who died of poisoning in an Italian prison three years ago. Now, that was God's banker. He represented the Vatican and was fed cyanide in an Italian jail and silenced him. So Calvi now has 500 pages of Sindona's writing that he can hold out, and, of course, Stefano has the list of 17,000 uh, fascist organizations and persons. And then Lizzie O'Jelly, according to this article, also goes into the fact that his friend Roberta Calvi was forced into a murder-suicide, uh, pushed into a suicide, which is literally a murder. And I guess he has a lot more information on the former president of the Banco Ambrosio, Bresi, Ambrosiano in Italy. These stories that are just the tips of the iceberg just stay that way and never allowed to develop. So there is a tremendous control over reporters and uh, radio and television and even the printed word and what comes into this country. We think we are free. We're not free. And the overseas press carry these stories and we never even get a bit of them. Now, getting to a local matter uh, in California that I haven't updated for a long time. This is an article from Marin Independent. Marin County is above San Francisco across the Bay Bridge. Uh, the Independent an article, December the 6th, 1987, that I didn't have time to share with you, but I don't want to pass it up any longer. The article says, Satanic church members, including a key figure in the Presidio child molestation case, have been linked to satanic cult activities in Marin County. William Butch, 34 years old, and Lynn Butch, 31, are listed in the Marin County Clerk's Office as founding two satanic cult groups, uh, Dark Star Nine Pylon and Meta Mates. Those are the names of the two groups. Now, William Butch is the brother-in-law of Michael Aquino, the lieutenant colonel in the Army Reserves and founder of the Temple of Set. Aquino was under investigation. He wasn't investigated at all on possible molestation uh, charges at the Presidio Daycare Center. William Butch's sister, Lilith, is Aquino's wife. Aquino owns property in Marin County and in Sonoma County, including a historic San Rafael house that he inherited from his mother. His mother's name was Betty Ford Aquino. I thought that was a quite an interesting uh, coincidence because of uh, all the mysterious and horrible things about Gerald Ford that I followed and noticed. And he was adopted. Gerald Ford was adopted and saw allegedly his natural father when he was eight years old. But anyway, let's chalk this up to a funny coincidence that Betty Ford Aquino mother of the founder of the Church of Set. And she also was a high priestess. She was a temple priestess. Ford Aquino died of cancer in San Francisco in 1985. She was a temple priestess. She left her son 3.2 million estate. Now, this is the woman who allegedly uh, was knocked up by a member of the Gestapo, pardon the expression, or went with a member of the Wampen SS. And the circumstances, of course, were very cloudy about uh, that relationship, uh, Mr. Aquino, Colonel Aquino has home with Nazi memorabilia, and he's the, remember, the fellow who went to Himmler's castle and does the satanic rituals to duplicate what Heinrich Himmler and the SS did. And, of course, these huge hunks of money come through to these people. I wonder if any of this Nazi money, just speculating, uh, how she got the $3.2 million that she just happened to leave to Michael Aquino. Now, among her property is a house on 828 Mission Street in San Rafael. That's leased to Project Care for Children, and another office leases part of that group, the Marin County Child Abuse Council. Now, there have been two mysteries of uh, disappearing children out here, one in Sacramento and one near San Jose, and uh, there was supposed to be a time for occult rituals just recently, in June, and these children haven't been found. 
And, of course, there's a lot of mysterious missing people continuing and not getting the news coverage. But Michael Aquino owns property that he rents to Project Care for Children and the Marin County Child Abuse Center. Aquino also inherited a professional building in San Rafael at 914 Mission Street and another professional building at 1212 4th Street in Santa Rosa. And uh, according to this article, uh, the relationship of him to the property, those other properties, has to do with Lilith and her brother. And the article says officials for Project Care for Children expressed shock that the building's owner was linked to the Presidio molestation case. Their center, they said, has nothing to do with uh, Michael Aquino. It's a private, nonprofit organization that helps parents find daycare. And uh, I remember uh, a lot of evidence of problems when children found f- help in finding daycare and what happened to them afterwards. In fact, the whole purpose of that meeting enough that uh, Dr. and Mrs. Polcat in San Francisco is because they went through an established bureau and uh, tried to find daycare for their little boy and then found that he was a victim of child abuse or molestation so that getting daycare for people doesn't mean that's the end of the problem. The article says this is the most ironic and bizarre twist of fate. Lynn Butch, who also used the name L. Darlene Butch, is the daughter of Harry Johnson, a wealthy Mill Valley developer who was allegedly kidnapped in September. And this is another story not with the child abuse, but with the story of this family involved with Michael Aquino and Lilith, his wife and her brother and sister-in-law. Dark Star 9 Pylon, which is filed under the corporation name of Temple of Nephthys, N-E-P-T-H-Y-S, lists an address on Indian Valley Road in Novato. The house was formerly occupied by a former friend of Lynn Butch, Patricia Lilly of Sonoma County. Dark Star is similar to the name originally given the Temple of Seth. A pylon, said a former temple member, get this name, Linda Blood, is a gathering of Satanists to practice occult rituals. Blood, when she was a temple member for nine months, said they held destructive rituals, destruction rituals, voodoo ceremonies with pins and needles, and they believed it would work. They believed that they could cause persons to die. Linda Blood left the temple and now works in Massachusetts for the Cult Awareness Network. Maida Mates is listed as doing business as a, in a professional building at 205 Camino Alto in Mill Valley and so forth. The article goes on and describes some more about Aquino, which I've had on my program, and his links to Gary Humbright at the Presidio Daycare Center. And, of course, all those uh, 10 counts of child abuse and molestation were dropped and the entire Aquino affair was dropped. So uh, running to child care centers has to be a very interesting coincidence. Now, I haven't done much on the, or hardly anything, on the McMartin Preschool, and I will do it. uh, We're going to be limited to tapes now because I'm going to stop at the end of July. There were two long articles in the Washington Post on the McMartin School, and I'm going to give you the source of those articles. And if you have access to the Washington Post, And if you're interested in the subject, you can copy it instead of my putting it on a tape. And if you don't have access and can't reach them, then I will share the information on the broad. It's not a broadcast. It's a tape. April the 17th, uh, 1988, the first uh, of two articles, April 17th, is titled The Terrible Puzzle of McMartin Preschool. In California, the long-running trial of a baffling child molestation case. It's not a child, it's children, and it is a horrible story. And while they're trying to work this out, as I mentioned a while back, they even have cameras ready to make movies about it, uh, going to the hearings and so forth. The second of the articles was May 18, 1988, called The Community of Fear. In Manhattan Beach, California, a long struggle for parents caught in the web of nightmares. So if you don't have access to the Washington Post, let me know, and I'll da- update those for you. But there's no reason to go into that um, at length now if you can get your hands on those articles. There was an article May 7th, last month, 1988, in our local area, San Jose Mercury, and this pertains to a town in Hollister, not too many miles from um, Carmel. It's in Monterey County. 
It's called Police Tie Murder to the Occult. Police are tying the Easter Sunday slaying of a Hollister woman to the occult. The man charged with her murder practiced black magic. Raul Sanchez Zamudio, a 41-year-old counselor at a county-operated home for juvenile delinquents, was arraigned. And again, you get these people in charge of juvenile delinquents. I remember way back, and I and I want to update it, the Charles A. Leonard Lake, Clarolyn Blazos case with Calaveras County with umpteen corpses, body bags taken out, about 36, it seemed. And Leonard Lake bit the cyanide bullet rather than face uh, investigations when he was picked up by the police. And Charles Ng is in Canada uh, fighting extradition. I think he'll be home soon to be charged with three or four murder cases. But Clarolyn Blazos, whose parents owned the property, still own it for all purposes, where a bunker was built for torture, and there were this was an occult group for also, but they were involved, I believe, in much higher political connections that uh, portend something very dangerous and serious. Uh, I mentioned those before. This Paul Cutter, Paul Seishola, who was sending arms to Iran, who worked with Cyrus Hashemi and Mr. Khashoggi, Adnan Khashoggi, the usual team of the CIA front runners for guns, drugs. Subterfuge, Mr. Paul Cutter has the same attorney, Mr. Carroll, that Clarelyn Blazas has. And there are indications to me, a lot of them, that this is a very, very political case. But Clarelyn works for the juvenile delinquents, too. She even took juvenile delinquents to the property up there where they had videotapes and photographed, uh, I don't know, couldn't be tortured because they went back to San Jose, but these young people were taken up there to the bunker for a weekend or weekends, plural, I don't know. So again, Raul Zamudio is a, a counselor at a county, paid by the county, operated home for juvenile delinquents. And how bad are the county homes or the fundings of federal and state money that the people who are handling these affairs are involved in satanic rituals and the occult and so forth? According to the police report released Friday, when they searched Zamudio's Hollister home, they found an altar and items that an expert in the occult uh, said linked to the occult fascination with fertility, sexuality, and virginity, and also, you might say, with murder, right? Okay. Zamudio, since 1984, that goes back four years ago, has been working with delinquents, and uh, so much for that. Now, a new book is coming out. Uh, you probably saw it on the weekend. It's in U.S. News and World Report uh, this week, titled Best Laid Plans, The Inside Story of America's War Against Terrorism, written by David Martin, Pentagon correspondent for CBS, and Jan, John Walcott, national security correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. And what they, uh, an excerpt from their book, what they have in their book is the fact that uh, Ollie North had planned to use Terry Waite, a negotiator with the hostages, who is now a hostage himself, to bait Muammar Gaddafi, send weight on the basis that maybe Gaddafi could help the hostages, Gaddafi would trust him, and they would meet in Tripoli, and Gaddafi would stay overnight. He would bait him to go there and uh, stay there because he couldn't get home for afterwards. They would meet on April the 14th, and then April the 15th, the U.S. bombing raid on Libya, and the Gaddafi would be killed. And Ollie North had written the uh, newspaper cover-up stories for it, just as I believe he did for the Korean airline, the Achille Laura, and TWA hijacking, and a lot of these terrorisms that came directly out of the national security state, the National Security Council. And as history evolves, you'll find this is true. Now, this Ollie North and the team around him, whether it was Admiral Poindexter, Navy Intelligence, or the Marines, uh, Robert McFarlane and William Casey of the OSS, who worked with Galen and the German spies to form our CIA and became CIA director, they have an absolute fixation on murder. And if they want to get uh, Muammar Gaddafi, why take a man who's trying to get the hostages out for the United States, for the world, uh, Terry Waite, and use him as a pawn to bait Gaddafi to be at a certain place. The mentality is so sick. And I believe that uh, um, the 
people, there are no people over the National Security Council. There's no president who says, wait, enough already. They worked outside the Pentagon, uh, a lot of them, most of the secret team, outside of the CIA, the FBI, the Congress. So the endangering of Terry Waits' life now is very possible because the hostages are holding him. And they may not believe that he didn't know why he was going to meet with Gaddafi on April the 14th in Tripoli. They may believe that he was setting Gaddafi up to be killed. The bombs did fall, and Gaddafi was almost killed. So the consequences of this book are yet to be seen about how they treat the hostages in the Middle East. But once again, it points to the insanity of this country and how these small pockets of people can plan these things in advance and use the United States Armed Forces and maneuvers and create their cover stories and get Gaddafi in a certain city. Oliver North just seems to be uh, groomed, in my mind, not only for the past things he did, but because of the mind control and experience in mental hospitals and because of all the things happening to him now, I think he is truly groomed for the becoming the future Fuhrer of the United States. He's on a roll, and if people don't wake up, this could be the man. He, His father, who he's very close to, had a hero. He worked with George Patton. Uh, Fritz Kramer, the general Fritz Kramer, was with George Patton. We don't know if Hitler's Kramer is the one in National Security Council that works with Ollie North. We know that the general Fritz Kramer of Adolf Hitler's was released by Senator Joe McCarthy. And the importance of the Kramer, Kissinger, uh, National Security Council, Reinhard Galen connections cannot be emphasized enough because no matter what happens now, North is on a roll unless you out there, you people, say enough already and try to do something about this national security state. There's an article in San Jose Mercury, and most of you saw it this past week, a jackpot for North. Speeches this year may earn more than $1 million. North will get $25,000 a speech, which is uh, $600 a minute, and he is being signed up by the speaking bureau that arranges such successful people as Henry Kissinger, again, part of the kissinger Gramer outfit, and Gerald Ford, a member of the Warren Commission who was never elected president, and who pardoned Richard Nixon, who ran against John Kennedy, and Oliver North. They've joined this group of speakers. And, of course, these are the highest-paid speakers in the country. And the team, again, stays together. Commander Navy Commander Tom Hayes, a trustee of the Oliver North Legal Assistance Fund, was un unsure how North's earnings as a lecturer would be mingled with the $1.5 million contributed to the fund. Now, why do you need an Oliver North Assistance Fund if he's making $25,000 a speech? His retirement from the service was going to be 23000 a month. So why not just hand that paycheck over to Brandon Sullivan, his attorney? The highest speaker for all of this, according to this article, is federal, uh, former federal chairman Paul Volcker, scientist Carl Sagan, and commentator Paul Harvey. Well, the economy in America is so bad with the debt, and, and uh, we could go on and on about the banks closing and so forth. I don't know why Paul Volcker gets more than any single person, which is 30000 Paul Harvey is a, a commentator of, uh, he's far, he's pretty far right, but that's okay. Let him get that for public appearance. And Carl Sagan, uh, I wish he'd get into more practical matters. It's easy to stay up there in the skies and face the National Security Council, National Security State. Underneath the article that North is getting a million dollars for possibly next year, 25000 a speech, there is an article Thailand renames their Nazi bar after foreigners complain. Bangkok, Thailand has a saloon which is called the Nazi bar, and now it's going to be renamed. The owners replaced their pictures of Adolf Hitler and pictures of the Nazi stormtroopers and Mussolini with auto racing posters, and they now have rechristened it No Name on Wednesday. That's the name of the bar. The waiters were wearing armbands with the Waffen SS. Gestapo, and of course, uh, it is a very popular place in Bangkok. The complaint was that it glamorized Hitler's brutal regime in Germany. The real problem is that it doesn't glamorize that. 
it is uh, calling attention to the resurgence of the Nazis all over the world, just those like those that I mentioned, the 13,800 in Italy. Bangkok has its Nazis ready to appear and wear the armbands. There's another book coming out by Ben Bradley. I said a long, long time ago, just wait till they start pouring out. Ben Bradley works for the Washington Post, and he works for the CIA because one CIA never passed CIA. The book is called The Rise and the Fall of Oliver North, and it will probably be a companion. Uh, it begins Guts and Glory, The Rise and Fall of Oliver North. It will be a companion to The Rise and Fall of Adolf Hitler or the books on The Rise and Fall of Richard Nixon after Watergate. Those guys were were rising, but I don't know that they ever fell. Ollie North is not falling, and according to this part of the books, uh, the book that was reprinted in the San Francisco Examiner yesterday, it said that when North worked with his team, he prepared to take fall for Iran-Contra, but he wasn't prepared to be fired. The shock changed his thinking. The previous day, he shredded evidence. Now, he would gather up what remained to protect himself, and this is what Ollie North controls. Well, if Ollie North controls that, he literally controls the United States government and the world and the workings and the meetings of the people uh, wrapped up in the Iran-Contra affair, which have international and fascist implications. So the uh, book will have details of uh, Richard Secord, part of that was in the Examiner yesterday, how he demanded that he and North and uh, Green, their attorney, get together immediately to confer with Tom Green as soon as they heard that the diversionary process had been exposed by Edwin Meese at a news conference. So they rented a room at the Sharon Hotel in Tyson's Corner. Secord and Green were there when North arrived. And then as soon as North was there, they got a telephone call from George Bush. Imagine what is in North's uh, 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 notebooks or what was in Fawn Hall's pants that she took away that day. Uh, I think it was more than... Uh, we can even imagine in terms of possibilities of diaries and so forth. She's pretty skinny and throw a sweater over it and you can get a lot of ledgers and notes out. Uh, I don't believe they were on her bra. But they met there and George Bush called them and then the President of the United States called them and the President, of course, said, uh, and it's in this book, you'd make a great movie uh, someday. And speaking of movies, there was a one-hour movie on ABC television on Ollie North. They're already making movies about him. And that movie that came out last Monday preceded the primaries around the country, and particularly in California, while Ollie North is campaigning. So this will be an interesting book, but just get a pencil when you buy it. And when it says the rise and fall of Ollie North, cross out the fall. We're the ones who are falling. Uh, Ollie North isn't falling, and Bed Bradley of the CIA is covering up again, like a lot of other people. Uh, Ollie North was in California campaigning for two people running for office, and both of them won in the primaries. One was a Mr. Rohrbacher, a former Reagan speech writer, and he won in the 42nd Congressional District. He was replacing Don Lundgren, who was engaged in a legal fight over an appointment as state treasurer. Now, was Lundgren, with dirty tricks like they're doing to Mr. Wright at this time, pushed out to make way for Rohrbacher, and then another person, Mr. Cox, who uh, Ollie North is very close to, a former White House counsel, ran for Congress in the 40th District, and he won, and he ran against a seat by Republican Representative Robert Badham. Badham resigned, making way for Cox, and a mini-scandal, unresolved, made way for Rohrbacher. Adolf Hitler stacked that Congress, if you called it one, in 1933, and then declared a total police state. I'm very much afraid of Ali North and the... Uh, posture he's taking, the money he has, how he can go all over to 50 states if he wants and work for various people until he kicks out the Congress or the congressional people, such as Representative Barnes in Maryland, uh, a person who was fingering the NSC, a courageous man fingering them, who went into total obscurity for doing a great job, and Carl Spitz Channel and the organizations that got rid of Barnes aren't even tapped on the finger. Spitz Channel pleaded guilty a year ago to the Iran-Contra affair and has even gone to jail. There's not even a word about him. He could be manipulating our um, elections. One quick word out of the Miami Herald. 
Judge King, uh, Judge Lawrence King, has allowed depositions of Edwin Wilson into the Christic Institute suit, which is very good because uh, Danny Sheehan said King's acceptance of Edwin Wilson's testimony is a major turning point because previously King ruled that he would examine only depositions covering a period from 1982. Wilson's testimony goes into the creation of a secret self-financed covert operation enterprise starting in the mid-1970s. So that is a victory for the Christic Institute. And Edwin Wilson is talking about Theodore Shackley setting up secret intelligence operations that committed assassinations, which includes Dallas. The um, it won't be in the Christic suit, of course. They take a later period. Smuggling drugs and weapons to the Nicaraguan Contras. Theodore Shackley is a defendant in the suit. A former CIA director uh, is, of course, not very happy about the Christic Institute suit, but Edwin Wilson is coming in to testify about their setting up drug running, um, gun running, and assassination teams, which fits into the uh, pattern of the Christic Institute suit, and Wilson will be allowed to give that information. One item that I don't have time to go into now, the tape is over, is an article in the Washington Times, Indictments Expected of Contra Supporters on Neutrality Violation. Uh, because the time is over, I won't uh, do it now. Mr. Tom Posey and uh, Jesu Garcia and poor Mr. Terrell, Jack Terrell, are going to be indicted for sending guns to the Contras. And, of course, they're controversial people, but the hour is up. I'll start with that next week and share the information on this case in the federal courts in Miami. This is Mae Russell, and I'll be back with you next week.